Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden news, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is April 15th. Today we celebrate a Swedish botanist with a famous father who observed flashes of light emitting from her nasturtiums. We'll also learn about a modern-day forest advocate and conservationist on a mission to create something that he calls a primary forest in France. We'll hear a poem about spring from the charming Christina Georgina Rossetti. And we grow that garden library today with a book that calls us to lead a wilder life, connecting with nature to find balance, energy, and restoration. And then we'll wrap things up with the little story of a botanist who was the inspiration for the term that I use to describe the sweet little stories that I end the show with every single episode, Botanic Sparks. But first, it's time for today's curated news. Curated news comes to us from Martha Stewart. This is a post that was written by Carolyn Biggs, and the title of the article is How to Propagate Your Favorite Herbs, such as Rosemary, Mint, Basil, and More. Well, you know, this is such a fantastic topic. I always say that if you're starting out as a gardener, one of the best things that you can begin to grow is herbs because they're virtually pest free and they're pretty simple to grow and they're just so useful. You can grow them, you can eat them, you can do so many things with herbs, either medicinally or just simply for their wonderful fragrance. Now, many people, once they've started growing herbs, are very curious about propagating them. They want more herbs. And so whether you're talking about root divisions or even cuttings, this post by Carolyn Biggs walks you through all of it. Now, let me give you just a little bit of a taste of what you can expect if you head on over to this post. First of all, there are wonderful videos that walk you through how to handle each of the herbs that are discussed in this post. Now, one of the experts that contributes to this article is Sue Betts, and Sue is the author of Herbal House Plants. Now, Sue says that when it comes to things like dill, cilantro, parsley, chervil, and calendula, Cuttings that are then rooted in a vase of water is a reliable way to go for propagating those types of plants. Now, another expert that weighs in on this post is Sue Getz. She's the author of Complete Container Herb Gardening. Sue says that if you have an herb that's got a clump forming root base, they are so easy to propagate by division because all you have to do is just break apart these plants and then you'll have brand new plants that you can grow and develop. So for this, be thinking of things like bee balm, mint, lemon balm, and chives. And chives are so easy to propagate. I always say you only need one clump of chives to get going because after that, you're going to have all the chives you will ever need. Anyway, this is a truly wonderful, authoritative resource for you if you have any interest at all in propagating your favorite herbs. Now, to find this post, I've made it so easy for you. I have put it in the Facebook group for the show. And once you're in that group, all you need to do is head on up to the very top underneath the heading. You'll see a little magnifying glass. And if you search for the word herb, this post will pop up. Now, if you're not in the Facebook group, please don't worry about it. You have a standing invitation. You can join the next time you're on Facebook. The group is entirely free 
and it is a private group. So whatever you share in the group, like maybe a picture of your garden or maybe a plant that you need identification help with, whatever it is, it will only be shared in the group and no one else will see it. So there you go. If you want to join the Facebook group, I would love to meet you there. All you need to do is head on up to the search bar the next time you're on Facebook and type in the words Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. I would love to meet you in the group. And while we're talking about the group, I just want to say that for those of you that have been sharing these beautiful pictures of your gardens... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because of course, up here where I'm at in my cabin, I'm probably a good four weeks behind most of you. And so seeing your pictures is a total delight. So thank you for doing that. It's a true day brightener. All right, it's time for today's botanical history. botanical history for today, April 15th. Today is the anniversary of the death of the Swedish botanist and the daughter of Carl Linnaeus, Elizabeth Christina von Linney, known to her family as Lisa Stina. She died on this day, April 15th in 1782. Lisa Stina fell in love with one of her father's star pupils, Daniel Solander. Linnaeus himself approved of the relationship. He had high hopes that Daniel might become not only his future son-in-law, but also his backfill as the professor of botany at the University of Uppsala. Yet, after spending time in England, Daniel elected not to return to Sweden. He would never again set foot in his home country. And despite sending letters referring to Lisa Stina as his sweetest mamzelle, London was too exciting, and Daniel informed Linnaeus by post that he would not be coming back. In the ensuing years, Linnaeus would often refer to Daniel, the pupil that got away, as the ungrateful Solander. Daniel would go on to travel with Joseph Banks in Captain James Cook's first circumnavigation of the globe on the ship Endeavour. Back home in England, Daniel became Joseph Banks' personal secretary and librarian. But sadly, his work was cut short when he died from a brain aneurysm at the age of 46. As for Lisa Stina, she ended up unhappily married to a grandson of Olaf Rudbeck, the man for whom the Rudbeckia is named. Rudbeckia are commonly known as black-eyed Susans. Now, when Lisa Stina was 19 years old and in love with Daniel Solander, she published a paper about a little-known occurrence that became known as the Elizabeth Linnaeus Phenomenon. Lisa Stina had been in her family's garden at twilight, and she had observed flashes of light coming from her nasturtium flowers. She told her father that the brighter reddish blossoms were the main source of the light. In her paper, she questioned whether the light came from the flowers themselves or if the flashing was an illusion. At the time, scientists could not discern the validity of her observations, and some even dismissed her claims altogether, assuming she'd imagined it. But 150 years later, a German professor would solve the mystery of the flashing flowers, which turns out to be an optical illusion that occurs at twilight. 
when the light bounces off the red color of the nasturtiums in contrast to the green leaves, the eye perceives it as a flash of light. The same effect can happen with other bright colored flowers like sunflowers, calendulas, and African marigolds. If you want to try to replicate this, you need to view the blooms at sunset and use your peripheral vision. Now, the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote about the Elizabeth Linnaeus phenomenon in one of his verses. He wrote, "'Tis said in summer's evening hour flashes the golden-colored flower, a fair electric flame." And you might be interested to know that the etymology of the nasturtium is Latin, nasus torsus, and it means nose twist or nose torment. And the word nose is found in many common names for nasturtiums, like the nose ticklers. And this is all due to the fact that the nasturtium leaves have a peppery, sinus-clearing taste, while the flower tastes a little bit sweeter. And today is the birthday of the French botanist, biologist, and conservationist, Francis Ali, who was born on this day, April 15th in 1938. Francis has spent over 40 years studying the ecology of tropical forests and the architecture of their trees. These scientific areas of study have shaped how Francis views not only trees and forests, but also our planet and the future. Atlas Obscura wrote an excellent feature article about Francis called The Botanist Who Made Fantastical Sketches of Rainforest Flora. In the atlas, Francis gives us a tour of the rainforest and the rare plant life that can be found only under the canopy of the forest's magnificent trees. For instance, Francis introduces us to a plant with a single enormous leaf. And he also introduces us to an invasive hyacinth, a walking tree, and a dancing vine, just to name a few. Francis also shares the history and lore of the many plants he profiles, like Queen Victoria's rubber tree and the Moabi tree, which legend says the bark can give the power of invisibility. Francis celebrates the wonders of the plant kingdom by sharing specimens with incredible characteristics. There's a flower that draws energy from trees, plants that can imitate other plants, a fern with cloning power, and trees that create rain. And all of this biodiversity is impossible without the protective covering of the rainforest. Today, Francis is passionate about forests. In a recent interview this past winter, Francis said, plants are so much smarter than us. They improve their environment while we destroy ours. Humans are trees' greatest enemy. Of course, parasites kill some, and storms bring down those with weak roots and stunted fibers. But all this serves to improve the species according to the laws of evolution. While we deprive the equatorial forests of their tallest upright trees, the most beautiful leaving only the lower trees. This madness will continue as long as there is a tree left to make money. I have no illusions. In 2019, Francis started an 800-year-long rewilding project. 
It's an initiative called the Association for Primary Forest. This project aims to create a primary forest in Europe in an area that would encompass 70,000 hectares. Francis says, I dream of a forest with zero management, like those I've had the privilege to see in the tropics. For me, a primary forest offers the ultimate biological diversity as well as the best in planetary aesthetics. A primary forest is a forest that has not been cleared, exploited, or modified in any way by man. Primary forests differ from plantation forests because plantation trees are planted to be used or harvested. In contrast, a primary forest would be planted to allow it to develop freely over millennia. As you can tell, primary forests are special places. And according to Francis, they offer much more carbon capture than secondary forests. And Francis calls primary forests summits of biodiversity. Primary forests also offer climate regulation and replenishment of water resources, along with countless other benefits. In 2021, when Elon Musk announced his $100 million award for the best ideas to capture carbon, Francis Ali quickly responded that his primary forest initiative was the ultimate carbon capture solution. So we'll see if Elon agrees with him. It was Francis Ali who said, I wonder if our initial relationship to trees is aesthetic rather than scientific. When we come across a beautiful tree, it's an extraordinary thing. It's time for Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from the English poet Christina Georgina Rossetti. This is her poem called A Winter Sonnet. A robin said, the spring will never come, and I shall never care to build again. A rosebush said, these frosts are wearisome, my sap will never stir for sun or rain. The half moon said, These nights are fogged and slow. I neither care to wax nor care to wane. The ocean said, I thirst from long ago because earth's rivers cannot fill the main. When springtime came, Red Robin built a nest and trilled a lover's song in sheer delight. Gray hoarfrost vanished, and the rose with might clothed her in leaves and buds of crimson core. The dim moon brightened. Ocean sunned his crest, dimpled his blue, yet thirsted evermore. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, A Wilder Life by Celestine Maddy. This book came out in 2016, and the subtitle is A Season-by-Season Guide to Getting in Touch with Nature. In this book, Celestine urges us to garden with a greater purpose than simply growing plants for food or beauty. She wants us to connect with our gardens and refresh our spirits. A Wilder Life is a beautiful coffee table book that offers tips for connecting with nature. 
Celestine's ideas include planting a night-blooming garden, learning to read the stars, creating a habitat for butterflies, dyeing your clothes with natural dyes, building an outdoor shelter, and learning to identify insects, just to name a few. Celestine's book and projects embrace the simple life trend that started just after the year 2000. And Celestine's book is divided into seasons, and within each season are five main sections. There's growing, which covers suggested plants. Then there's cooking, which offers a fantastic section with seasonal recipes, home and self-reliance, beauty and healing, and Wilderness, which is my favorite section, and it offers a guide to appreciating all that nature offers in the season. This book is 272 pages of restoration and connection with nature by living a wilder life. You can get a copy of a Wilder Life by Celestine Maddy and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $3. It's a steal. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the anniversary of the death of the English botanist Alexander Garden, who died on this day, April 15th in 1791. Alexander's story is a fascinating one, starting with the fact that he had the perfect last name for a botanist, Garden. And in case you're wondering, the gardenia flower is named in honor of Alexander Garden. After immigrating from England, Alexander had settled in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, if you've ever wondered how I came up with the term botanic spark to describe the sweet little stories that I end the show with, it was a term that I read in a letter that was written by Alexander Garden. One summer, Alexander found himself stuck in Charleston while many of his botanist friends were off exploring and botanizing. In a letter to the botanist John Bartram, Alexander wrote, Think that I am here, confined to the sandy streets of Charleston, where the ox, where the ass, and where man as stupid as either, fill up the vacant space while you range the green fields of Florida. He was a little jealous. And then to John Ellis, who had sent Alexander detailed accounts of his botanizing, Alexander wrote, I know that every letter which I receive from you not only revives the little botanic spark in my breast, but even increases its quantity and flaming force. When the Revolutionary War began, Alexander sided with the British, even though he sympathized with the colonists. Alexander's son, Alexander Jr., fought against the British. As a consequence, Alexander and his son became permanently estranged, and they never forgave each other. A biographical sketch of Alexander sadly reported that Alexander's son had a little girl that he had named Gardenia. But after the two men had parted ways, Alexander never met his little granddaughter with the flower name that honored the botanical work of her grandfather. Now, when the war was over, Alexander and other British sympathizers were punished. In Alexander's case, his property was confiscated and he was forced to leave South Carolina. 
After losing everything, Alexander and his wife and two daughters went to live in London, where he became vice president of the Royal Society. He died of tuberculosis at the age of 61 on this day, April 15th in 1791. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove in Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Vance, Brooke Bierbaum, and Eric Begay. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.